Well, good morning everyone. I hope you're all doing well uh, in this fourth Sunday of a lockdown. Now, it's such a privilege to be able to share with you this morning from God's Word. Before I begin though, if I may share with you just a couple of notices. Uh, you would have received an email from us last week about our relief fund. Now, that relief fund has been set up to help those among us in, in our church or from our church who have lost their jobs or lost income uh, due to the current situation in our country. Now, if you have any queries about that fund, please won't you call, contact me, give me a call, uh, and we can discuss it further. Now, we're also trying to get our snap scan system up and running. And so, in that same email, you would have received a QR code like this. I'll post it on the screen for you. Now, it's not the mark of the beast. What Jill and I have done is we have stuck this on our fridge. And uh, when we want to give 10 Rand, 20 Rand or 50 Rand to the church, we, we just stop, use our cell phones, scan it in and, uh, and pay the money across. Please won't you consider using the system. You know, most of us don't want our businesses to fail. I think even in the same manner, we, we would, wouldn't like it for our church to fail. And so please, won't you help us? So this will help us tremendously. And so now, would you mind turning with me to uh, our text this morning, the first letter of Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter uh, 1 and verses 3 to 9. And I'm going to read it for you. I'm going to try and put the text on the screen. We'll see if that works. <clears throat> and then we'll pray. We'll listen to God's word. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation that is to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is in inexpressible and filled with glory. Verse 9. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can come to your word. And we just pray now that you would speak to our hearts and encourage us in this time from your word. Thank you so much for the Bible, Lord. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, I would encourage you to open your Bibles this morning. If you haven't got your Bible yet, uh, pause this video. Um, go and get your Bible, open it up, and, and then restart the video. Uh, that's one of the benefits of, of, um, of being able to do a church in this way. Well, you know, I've been to the UK a couple of times, a few times in fact. As most of you know, our daughter and her family uh, live in London. And uh, we also have a number of English friends, very dear English friends. And I must say that I, I find the English to be um, somewhat quaint, uh, a bit quirky, a little bit strange. Um, uh, of course, that, that is with the exception of our friends. Um, but the English also have a remarkable quality. 
they rise to adversity. They really do. I mean, you might have heard the story or read about the story about Captain Tom. Uh, it's been all over the news in England at the moment. Uh, uh, Captain Tom is turning a hundred. And to mark his hundredth birthday and to raise funds for the NHS, Captain Tom decided to do a hundred laps around his garden. Uh, he's an old man. Uh, it, it's marvelous. You can see the pictures of him. He has a walker. Uh, but this was how he was going to play his part in, in this, current, this current crisis uh, to help the NHS. His target was a thousand pounds. Well, Captain Tom captured the hearts of the British people. There, there was a, it's, 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 it's wonderful really, there was a, a military guard of honour that saluted him across the finish line. He has also broken his target of a hundred thousand, well not of a thousand of pounds, that was the initial target. He's broken that target now. Now I don't know what it will have reached by the time you watch the service on Sunday morning. But at the moment, this, this is Friday, he has already, get this fuck, he's already raised 17 million pounds. 17 million pounds. I mean, Captain Tom is a hero. I mean, they're talking about making him a knight of the realm. And I think they should. I mean, he, he needs to feel that cold steel on his shoulder. It's a, it's a heartwarming story. I mean, it brings a smile to your lips. I mean, you know, it really, it's the quirky English with that remarkable quality. They rise to adversity. But what about us? What about us as Christian people? Not necessarily as South Africans, but as Christian people across the world. I mean, how do we as Christians respond to adversity? How do we respond to this current crisis? Well, we really have something which not only warms the heart or, or brings a smile, uh, it, it fills the heart with a deep and an abiding joy. That's what our text is about this morning. Um, Peter was writing to Christians experiencing extreme difficulties, extreme hardships. I mean, they, they were living in exile, many of them in, in, in what is now Turkey, modern day Turkey, scorned, ridiculed, facing persecution. And Peter's intention is to direct them to this deep and abiding joy that we as Christians know. Now I've called it in my talk this morning, locating your joy. I mean, verse 6, Peter says, in this you rejoice. No, he's not saying that suffering brings joy. No, not at all. I mean, suffering is painful, always is painful, never pleasant. And so what is Peter speaking of when he says, in this you rejoice? Well, in verses 3 to 9, he gives three places where joy is located and where your joy ought to be located. Firstly, <coughs> It's located in what God has done for you. Secondly, it's located in what God is doing for you at this very moment. And then thirdly, it's located in what God intends for you. Well, what has God done for you? Where do you locate your joy in that? Have a look at verses 1 to 4. And Peter begins his letter by, by diving, as it were, into the theological deep end. And Christians are God's elect, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Christ through the sprinkling of His blood. That's powerful stuff. And in itself, I mean, that, 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 uh, the theology in that verse has generated a huge amount of debate among Christians over the years. 
But folks, you know, great truths aren't there for debate. No, they're there for worship. I mean, they should stir our hearts, not our minds. I mean, have a look at what Peter says in verse 3. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, that is what the truths of, this, of the Bible should do for us. It should always lead to worship. They're not there for, for kind of mental push-ups, as if to exercise our minds. No, they're there to stir our hearts in worship. And look at what Peter goes on to say. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Yes, you are God's elect, but the cause, the, the basis, the grounds, the, the reason why God chose you was not because he saw anything in you. There was no merit in you, no goodness in you. No, he chose you because of his great mercy. And because of his great mercy, he has caused you to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, often that language of, of being born again, these days at least, has, has been and is misused. I mean, some communities, uh, it's associated with, with kind of like a list of check boxes, tick boxes. Now, if you don't smoke or drink or swear or um, wear makeup, unfortunately I don't wear makeup, but then, well, then you're born again. You know, I remember when, when I became a Christian, uh, it was a no-no in, in, in those days to wear jeans. I mean, denim, for some reason, was considered to be not respectable and we had a number of other things on our checklist as well and in essence what it was was legalism it didn't help you it didn't help you to to live a godly life it wasn't true or real christianity not at all i mean nothing could have been further from the truth than that now, you see the language of being born again actually captures a wonderful spiritual truth it is biblical language there's something God does for you. There's something God has done for you if you're a Christian. And when you think about it, you had as much control over your spiritual birth as you had over your natural birth. I don't think any of us would like, claim to have had any control over our natural birth, any cause. No, it was none at all. You see, it's the same with spiritual birth. I mean, God, by His Spirit, made you alive in Christ when you believed the Gospel. It was at that moment that God became your Father in Heaven. You became part of a new family. You had to grow and mature as a Christian. There was much for you to learn and to understand. And then on top of which, you were born into great wealth. Not, not the wealth that the prosperity teachers would, would want you to believe or would want to promise to, to their poor gullible audience. No, but into an inheritance that is laid up for you and for me in heaven. Now, I'm not sure how much my children are going to inherit after this crisis. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't much for them to inherit before the crisis, but... But be that as it may, I mean, it's at times like this that we really learn, don't we, of just how fragile things are, how fragile our, our systems are, our economies are, our, in fact, how fragile life itself is. I mean, I read the other day that, that $24 trillion was wiped off global markets. You know, I, I can't even get my head around uh, a figure that big. I mean, that's about 400 trillion rand. And then, of course, tragically, there are, there are the, the deaths. I mean, I think globally, we're heading towards 150,000 mark. 150,000 is a lot of people. It's a lot of sadness. It's a lot of grief, a lot of suffering, a lot of pain. 
But ultimately, folks, that's, that's where life ends. That's where your investments will end. Ultimately. You see, there's a full stop, isn't there, when you die. There's a, and for the non-Christian, I mean, the, the story is so bleak. There's a full stop when you die. Yes, yes, the British may rise to the occasion. And it's a testimony, isn't it, what's happened there with, with Captain Tom. It's a testimony to the human spirit and to that quality of theirs to rise to adversity. But you know, in the end, all a non-Christian has is loss. The warmth in the heart, the, the smile on the lips is only a temporary experience. It's momentary. It's won't last. Now the Apostle Peter, on the other hand, locates your joy in permanence. I mean, have a look at verse 4. You see, it's into an inheritance that is imperishable. Listen to the words. Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you. See, Christian, that is where your joy is. And my joy must be located. It's in what God has done for you. He saved you when he caused you to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's why Peter calls it a living hope. You see, death is not the full stop for the Christian. It is, of course, for the non-Christian. In fact, it's worse than a full stop for them, but not so for the Christian. No, because Jesus has been raised from the dead. You know, the stock market, market might crash, and that crash might have wiped out your savings. It might have cost you your job and, and all your business. And that really is a tragedy. But folks, it won't. It will never take away your inheritance in heaven. Now, according to the Apostle Peter, see in verse 4, that inheritance is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And how can you know that with certainty? See, in this uncertain world, in all this, this, this uh, shakiness that's going around at the moment, all this uncertainty that, that is permeating our world at the moment, how can you know that with certainty? Well, it's in the text, isn't it? That's why we ask our friends to open their Bibles. Look at the Bible. Look at what it says. It says, because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And so firstly, your joy is located in what God has done for you. Secondly, it's located in what God is doing for you. Have a look at verse 5. Who by God's power are being guided through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now what is God doing for you at this very moment, according to this verse? What is he doing for you at this very moment, even in the midst of this fiery trial that, that you may be experiencing? Well, he's keeping you, isn't he? He's preserving you, watching over you. He's guarding you and protecting you. You know, the church has a, a, a long and, and glorious history of those who have gone before us and who have fought the good fight, who have faced trials and tribulations and difficulties and, and whatever. And these people, these, these Christians, stand as a testimony, as it were, to God's power of preservation, of keeping his people in the midst of their trials. I mean, if you want to uh, want a good book, uh, try reading Fox's Book of Martyrs. I, I've often recommended that as, as one of two books that Christians ought to read. I mean, uh, number one is, of course, Pilgrim's Progress. The, number two is Fox's Book of Martyrs. Not a bit difficult reading it in the old English. It's, it's doable, but, but difficult. But you can get a modern version. And in that book, you'll read about the apostles who, apart from John, were all killed for their faith. 
You'll read about the early church there. The, the, the main suffering that people went through. You'll read about someone, for example, like Polycarp, uh, who was burnt at the stake. For his faith and when the when the flames failed to kill him well they stabbed him to death he was 86 years old when they did that to him uh, you will read in fox's book about the reformers who were burnt at the stake some of them uh, were bishops bishop latimer ridley and cranmer cranmer was responsible for writing our prayer book but you know when when John Fox fin finished writing his book at the, towards the end of the 16th century. The story of Christian suffering or of Christians dying for their faith, it didn't end then. No, not at all. I mean, uh, we can read, for example, about the torture of the French Huguenots. Uh, their sufferings were horrific. I mean, it's what sort of caused them to flee France. You can read about the killing, the killing fields of Cambodia. I mean, some of the stories in there are, are just horrible. But that story goes on and on and on. But, but you know, one thing that stands out in the midst of all of them, it's that they bear testimony to God's preserving power. So he keeps his people in the midst of their trial. And he will keep you and me. Now you might say, oh, but my faith is so weak. I, I'm not, I'm not strong. I, I, I won't, I won't make it to the end. Think about this for a moment. Let these thoughts uh, settle in your mind. That's what Peter is writing about. See, God chose you according to his foreknowledge from before the foundation of the world. And in his great mercy, he calls you to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And now Peter says that his power will shield you through faith to the very end. Folks, when you, when you look at it in this, in this context, well, it's ludicrous, isn't it? It's silly to, even for a moment, to doubt or to entertain the thought that that God's power will somehow have a glitch or a hiccup and that it'll come short and that it'll fail you or fail to keep you in the midst of your trial. No, brothers and sisters, it can't be. Well, that, does, that, does that mean that we can just sit back and do as we please? No, not at all. It says that, have a look at the text. It says that by God's power we are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. See, what happens is in the midst of trial we continue to put our faith in trust in our Lord Jesus Christ and our Saviour. I mean, that is, that is one of the marks of a true believer. It's one of the marks of God's preserving power. It's one of the marks of the perseverance of the saints. I mean, some people uh, often ask the question when they're confronted by these truths, well, how do I know if I'm saved? I mean, that's, that's a, in many Christians, it's a very real question. Well, one of the things that I would encourage you not to do is, is not to put your trust in a decision you made some years ago. When I look at myself, I mustn't put my, my, my trust in a decision I made 47 years ago. No, not at all. You see, being a Christian is trusting the Lord every moment of the day. And so when you wake up in the morning, what do you do? Well, you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you do when you go to sleep at night? Well, you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It never stops. That's the mark of a true Christian. That doesn't mean that we won't have our ups and downs, our struggles. Not at all. No, we, but we will keep on trusting. And in the midst of that, we, we look at what it is that keeps us there. See, it's God's power. That's what Peter's saying. His power will preserve us through faith until the end. 
And Christians, that's where your joy and my joy must be located. Not only in these dark and difficult days. No, our joy always lies in the God who keeps us by his mighty power. And it brings me to the third place where Peter locates your joy. And it's in what God intends for you through this fiery trial. See, it's, it lies in the testing of your faith. Now that sounds a bit like a contradiction. I mean, none of us like suffering. A few of us will choose trial. I mean, my choice, if it came down to me, would be for an easy life. Well, my favorite YouTube channel uh, is, in fact, looking at yachts that are for sale. Not that I want to flee. Not that I want to leave and, and well, maybe, but, no, it's, and not that I can buy one, not at all. I mean, I just love their beauty and, and the dream, the dream of sailing the seas. But you see, according to Peter, trials are better for me as a Christian. See, God will use the trials that come to my life as a means to refine my faith, and He'll do the same for you. And it's what He's going to do in this present crisis. And the reason why, according to Peter, is because our faith is more precious, and my faith is more precious indeed than a yacht made of gold. Now, Peter doesn't quite mention a yacht, but, but have a look at verses 6 and 7. He writes this, he says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, genuine faith is precious. It's more precious than God that perishes. But what does that faith look like? See, that is a question we need to ask. What does that faith look like? What is God busy refining? How will it come? What will it look like as it comes after it comes through the fire? I mean, we hear a lot about faith these days. I mean, there's even a, a channel on TV called the Faith Channel. I would never recommend watching that channel. No, it's, it's full of word of faith, heresies. It's not the kind of faith Peter's talking about in this, this section at all. I mean, I, I listened to a chap called Andrew Womack the other day. Uh, he's one of the word of faith um, teachers. He's a false teacher. Now, what he believes, and this is quite revealing, he believes that his faith is so strong that he doesn't get sick, that he is somehow spared from the, the normal trials that come upon the human race. And he says that if someone, in fact, came to him, even now, with the coronavirus, and they touched him, well, he wouldn't get sick, they would get better. I was blown away by their arrogance. Now, he is practicing social distancing, which is interesting, isn't it? I mean, he, he's practicing social distancing. But listen to his reason why he does so. He says, it's not for himself, he says. It's for those whose faith is weaker than his and who are more, therefore more vulnerable than him to getting sick. Now, folks, Peter's not talking about that kind of faith. Not at all. I mean, that kind of faith is not real faith. It's not biblical faith. It's not how Peter measures faith. No, real faith is that which stands the test of trial. See, it's the kind of faith Bishop Latimer displayed when he was about to be burnt at the stake with, with Bishop Ridley. You know, as the flames were being kindled, uh, this is what he has supposedly said. He turned to Master Ridley and he said, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England 
they shall never be put out. I mean, that's the kind of faith that results in praise and glory when Jesus returns. That's the kind of faith where joy is located. And that's what God intends for you and for me in this current crisis. See, I don't know how God is going to use this crisis to test my faith or yours. yours. It might be that he's going to test us as a church to see how indeed we pull together and how we help each other out in this fiery trial. But whatever it is, see we know that he always does what is good. God is good. And we know that he always works all things to the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And so what I'm going to do as I close is I'm going to read verses 8 and 9 for you. Just again, and close with them. I believe they really sum up the kind of faith and the salvation that Peter is talking about in this section. And the joy that flows from it. I mean, the story about Captain Tom, as much as it is inspiring and, and beautiful, and as much as it warms the hearts and lifts the spirits, and, and it has done so in England and, and I think across the world. In as much as that has happened, well, our joy as Christian people is located in something far greater and far more enduring. See, it's located in what God has done for you in saving you. It's located in what, is God, in what God is doing for you in keeping you. And it's in, located in what God intends for you. Have a look at verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray together. Our oh, gracious Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, in these times, in these difficult times, please help us. Help us to locate our joy in you, in what you have done, in what you are doing, in what you are intending. And strengthen us. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.